The United States. It's the world's largest oil producer, yet it still brings in millions of barrels of foreign oil every single day. At first glance, that might sound strange, even contradictory. Why would any country import what it already has in surplus? Hang on. This story runs deeper than most people realize, and it traces back through decades of global politics, refining technology, and strategic energy moves. Most of us associate colossal oil output with places like Saudi Arabia or Russia, yet the U.S. actually outpumps them all. In recent years, American production has hovered around 21 million barrels of petroleum daily, while the nation's consumption is roughly 20 million barrels. On paper, it appears the U.S. should be completely self-sufficient. But real-world oil markets don't run on a simple, produce it, then use it logic. Instead, they're shaped by multiple factors, historical, technological, and even geographical. To understand how the U.S. earned the top spot in production, it helps to realize that biggest producer doesn't necessarily mean biggest reserves. Venezuela, Saudi Arabia, and Canada hold far larger underground stockpiles than the U.S., but they don't always pump them at maximum speed. Meanwhile, the U.S. fully leans into advanced drilling methods, aiming to extract as much as it can whenever it's profitable. This approach helps flood markets and can keep prices lower, which is actually good news for a country that loves driving, flying, and heating large homes. Middle Eastern nations manage their output more cautiously, using organizations like OPEC to maintain stable or higher prices. America, by contrast, relies on private companies pursuing profits, not a single government-controlled oil agenda. That difference sets the stage for a lot of the paradoxes we're about to explore. Oil isn't just a domestic product. It's a global commodity traded around the clock. A crisis in one part of the world can send prices soaring everywhere else, and that's where OPEC comes in. Formed in 1960 by some of the most oil-rich nations, OPEC collectively adjusts the global supply to steer prices in a way that benefits their member states. If they suspect the price of oil is too low, they agree to produce less, which helps push prices up. If prices become excessively high and threaten demand, they can boost output to stabilize the market. The U.S. remains outside that club, partly because American policymakers prioritize cheaper energy over maintaining high revenue from oil exports. Saudi Arabia and its allies rely heavily on petroleum to fund government budgets. On the flip side, the American economy has a broad range of industries, from tech to manufacturing, so it's not as dependent on oil exports for its survival. Still, the U.S. can't just crank out barrels and stay entirely insulated from global price swings. When OPEC tightens the spigot, everyone feels it at the pump. Even the world's top producer can't escape that. Furthermore, the U.S. didn't always dominate oil output. That's a relatively recent phenomenon driven by breakthroughs in extraction technology. It's also a product of a historical journey that saw America shift from a comfortable exporter to a massive importer, then back to top producer status while still relying on foreign barrels. If the U.S. can meet or even exceed its own consumption, why bring in additional oil from places like Canada, Saudi Arabia, and other exporting nations? The short answer, refining compatibility. Crude oil comes in different varieties. Heavy, light, sweet, sour. Each type has its own density and sulfur content, and not all refineries can process every grade. Many American refineries, especially those along the Gulf Coast, were built decades ago when the U.S. was relying heavily on heavier foreign crude. Those facilities are optimized to refine thick, high-sulfur oil from the Middle East or Venezuela. Conversely, much of the oil now produced in Texas, North Dakota, and other shale hotspots is light-sweet crude, which is actually simpler to refine in a technical sense, but only if you have the right infrastructure. Refining equipment isn't a quick swap. It would cost billions of dollars to overhaul older refineries so they could process more of America's lighter crude. Until those upgrades happen, and many companies hesitate to spend that kind of money in an age where renewables are on the rise. It often makes more financial sense to export large quantities of the light oil the U.S. pumps out, than import heavier grades from Canada, Mexico, or elsewhere to match domestic refinery requirements. In other words, these refineries need the right fit. It's a bit like owning a coffee machine designed for one kind of coffee pod while your cupboard is full of a different brand. Instead of replacing the entire coffee machine, you might just swap pods with a neighbor who has the machine that matches yours. That neighbor analogy sums up why America both exports millions of barrels each day and imports millions of barrels at the same time. To grasp why this refining mismatch exists in the first place, look back a century. 
Around the early 1900s, the U.S. was indeed an oil giant, at times responsible for nearly 70% of the world's entire output. Places like Texas and Oklahoma had iconic oil booms, fueling a wave of new wealth and forging America's early automotive culture. But the picture changed after World War II when economic growth skyrocketed. Factories, households, and the growing network of highways all demanded more and more petroleum products. While the U.S. had its own oil, policymakers and businesses realized that foreign crude could often be cheaper to import, especially from newly tapped mega-reserves in the Middle East. Rather than drain its own wells too quickly, the U.S. ramped up imports to satisfy spiking demand. This arrangement carried on for decades, and then OPEC emerged in 1960, formalizing a cartel of major producers who could unify and negotiate globally. The Arab oil embargo of 1973 rocked America, leading to spiraling prices and vivid scenes of drivers waiting in endless gas station lines. Suddenly, being reliant on external suppliers felt dangerous. Yet, while that crisis sparked talk of Project Independence under President Nixon, it didn't instantly break America's addiction to foreign oil. The cost advantages and market realities still made imports attractive. Eventually, the U.S. developed a strategic petroleum reserve to buffer against future embargoes or crises. Even so, importing foreign oil remained a standard practice, and it stayed that way until technology for drilling deeper and cracking shale deposits transformed everything. This fresh method of extraction would jumpstart another era of America rising to the top in production. No discussion of modern American oil production is complete without mentioning hydraulic fracturing, commonly called fracking. By injecting high-pressure fluid into rock formations, drillers can fracture the shale and release oil and natural gas once thought too difficult to reach. This revolution catapulted U.S. daily output to levels that, a few decades prior, would have been inconceivable. Fracking had a ripple effect worldwide, with American producers pumping out so much oil, global supplies rose, and prices often dipped lower than they might have otherwise. Consumers generally benefited at the pump, but companies dependent on higher prices faced new economic challenges. Yet fracking also brought a storm of controversies. Environmental groups argue that the chemicals used in fracturing fluids pose risks to groundwater. In certain regions, residents reported an uptick in seismic activity, possibly linked to wastewater injection. Critics also point to methane leaks that might accelerate climate concerns. On the flip side, proponents note that fracking generates jobs, spurs local economies, and provides tax revenue. They also suggest that natural gas, often a byproduct of fracking, can be cleaner than coal for power generation. This delicate balance, lower prices, job creation, but environmental questions, has shaped the conversation around U.S. energy. And while the fracking boom made America the biggest oil producer on Earth, it didn't magically erase the need for foreign heavy crude. Many wells in Texas and North Dakota yield mainly light oil. That's fantastic if you have the right refinery set up for it. But if you're one of the large Gulf Coast facilities, tailored to process Venezuelan or Saudi Arabian heavy blends, you're still going to import a good portion of your feedstock. Given this refining puzzle, it might appear wasteful to export large volumes of U.S. oil only to import at the same time. But economics isn't always about just meeting domestic needs. Private oil companies have the freedom to sell to whichever buyer pays more. If European or Asian markets offer higher prices for the light sweet crude from the Permian Basin, that's where the oil goes. Meanwhile, if heavy oil from Canada arrives at a good price for American refineries designed to handle it, that import deal makes perfect sense. Additionally, oil is priced in a global marketplace. Even if the U.S. tried to hoard its own production, the overall price per barrel would still be driven by international dynamics. When a major conflict disrupts supply in the Middle East, or when OPEC votes to reduce global output, the ripple effect hits American gas stations too. Conversely, if a slowdown in the global economy curbs demand, producers in West Texas might find themselves cutting back because it's no longer profitable to run at full capacity when prices drop below their break-even points. There's another angle. Building new refineries or upgrading old ones to handle more light crude is a massive capital-intensive undertaking in an era where investors and governments are turning a sharper eye toward renewables. Spending billions on new fossil fuel infrastructure carries mounting risks. If global demand for oil declines in the coming decades, driven by electric vehicles, green technology, or policy changes, those upgraded facilities could become stranded assets. So, at least for now, the U.S. sticks to this odd-seeming system. Produce a ton of light oil, 
export a large share of it, and bring in heavy crude from abroad. Though it sounds counterintuitive, it works for the companies and refineries involved. The byproduct of all this? The US, in effect, has energy muscle thanks to high production levels, but remains deeply entangled with the rest of the planet's oil supply chains. So, that's the reality behind America's oil paradox. Top producer on one hand, constant importer on the other. While it might look contradictory at first glance, it's actually the result of a century's worth of strategies, infrastructure decisions, and market forces. Will the nation overhaul its refineries and fully rely on its own oil, or will rising renewables make all these debates feel dated? Only time will tell. If you're eager to keep up with the latest twists in energy, economics, and global politics, subscribe and stay tuned for more straightforward analysis. Your perspective on where we get our oil, and why, may never be the same again. Let's keep this conversation going.